Well, thank you very much for that extensive introduction. I appreciate it very much. And I, I certainly want to say that um, you know, all those uh, accomplishments are really um, not all my own and, and have been a collaborative effort. Certainly want to thank Dr. Boley for giving me the opportunity to do that work here, the Department of Medicine for their support, and my lab, many of which are here today, and the fellows who I work with who helped me push this work forward. It's not uh, something that one person alone could do, and it really has been a team effort. So I want to take you through a little bit of my work, or one aspect of it, and really to, to give the kind of the stage for this is that I have an overarching interest in atherosclerosis, from prevention, prediction, to plaque rupture and acute MI. It is the disease state of interest that allows me to run my clinical work through the spectrum of the cardiovascular disease prevention program that I do uh, in combination with endocrinology and TRE, so it's the Diabetes Obesity uh, Prevention Center, all the way through to work in the CCU at both university and Jewish hospital. So my interest in cardiovascular risk prediction started back in 2013 when the new guidelines were printed and there was a recommendation to use a new risk score um, at the time called the ACC AHA uh, ASCVD risk score, now more popularly known as the pooled cohort equation. And a couple things struck me about this uh, tool. The first was it was derived and uh, produced from the Framingham cohort, for the most part, I said pooled cohort creation, so it was many cohorts, but they were all from decades ago, with Framingham data going all the way back to the 1960s. And there was really no substantial comparison. They did some uh, small comparison, but no substantial comparison with what was the current standard of care. Right? If you're going to introduce a new drug, um, you're going to introduce Prosegrel or Ticagalor, you compare it against what's currently on the market, like clopidogrel. But there wasn't that comparison done. So we first took a look at that. So we, we looked at what was in, in practice at the time. There's a couple of uh, Framingham risk scores that uh, looked at CHD or CVD. There was the, uh, the, the guideline recommended ATP3 score, the Reynolds risk score, and then also uh, this new score. So we wanted to see how this new score that was now promoted in the guidelines uh, stood up against the others. And I, I don't want to belabor this, but it didn't perform any better. In fact, all the scores were overestimating risk substantially. If you look at the guideline recommended risk score here, at, uh, the calculated risk of 7.5 to 10%, where physicians are really trying to make that balance, should this patient be on aspirin, should I be prescribing a statin medication in addition to lifestyle? And you compare that to... Um, what the actual observed event rate is in those individuals in the MESA study, you could see that the observed rate in men and women was substantially lower, well outside of this 7.5 to 10% range. How about discrimination? You know, that's what, you know, so that, that's calibration is the first slide. Discrimination is our second slide. So how well does it differentiate who and who is not going to have a cardiovascular event you can see here that all the scores uh, perform about the same. And so the new, the new risk score was not outperforming um, with, with discrimination and certainly was not well calibrated, at least when we looked against MESA. So we immediately asked why. Why are these scores not working well? Um, and these are some of the topics I'll, I'll try to cover today. And I really want to focus on the last three. So we're going to move through the top ones quickly. Um, and I've spoken about these before. So this is, you know, maybe it was because the validation cohort we're using, MESA, was not really um, uh, predictive of the, the population that we were targeting. Maybe everyone in MESA was highly medicated, taking aspirin and statin, and it, it, it wasn't a, a true um, comparison. Maybe we missed events in MESA. Maybe the patients who, uh, or the subjects who enrolled in MESA were were really, heavy, uh, really healthier than uh, average Americans and were uh, enrolling in the study because they were interested and healthy. Maybe the score just didn't work well by different races. Uh, maybe there was individual factors. It doesn't work well in people who have hypertension. Or maybe the, the statistical methods used to make it weren't very good. And then we'll talk about these last three in more detail, meaning what is the score actually predicting? I, I, I noted earlier that 
Um, one of the things we noticed was that the new risk score was derived from cohorts years ago. Well, what we were calling a myocardial infarction in the 1970s and 80s is really not the same thing we call a myocardial infarction today, and we'll talk about that. We'll talk about how uh, all myocardial infarctions are not the same, and if they're different, their risk factors may be different, and therefore you would need to use different risk prediction models to predict them. And then finally, we'll talk about the difference between atherosclerotic plaque, which is you know, a, a necessary and requisite substrate to have an event, but is not an event itself. The atherothrombotic event is what we're interested in. Okay, so to start tackling some of these problems, I'm gonna go through this data quickly. Uh, it's, it's not to, to show you the details. So we took MESA and we did a sensitivity analysis where we removed anyone who was taking aspirin or statin at any point during the 10-year follow-up. And that didn't seem to help at all. The results were still the same, massive overestimation of risk. Um, we looked for missing events by accessing CMS and, and um, looking for events through um, a billing databases and these were unadjudicated events, so we're not really sure, but it, it, it turns out that there was only nine events that were potentially missed in MESA, so that didn't make a difference. But healthy cohort effect, so we compared MESA and the characteristics of the patients in MESA to the NHANES, uh, which is you know, really a comprehensive look at the, the U.S. population. And then we also uh, put up here the characteristics of the cohort that they, they use to derive the risk score. You see, actually, that MESA was a better match to the general population than, than even the cohort. So that didn't seem to be the reason. Broke it down by uh, sex and race and ethnicity. Still saw overestimation across the board. So that wasn't an explanation. We looked at all the individual factors. And uh, what we saw is that no matter who the patients were or what their underlying individual factors were, we still saw overestimation. So that didn't seem to be it either. Now, when it comes to methodology used to derive these risk scores, um, there we have continued interest and are doing continued work. So this is not our work. This is work by Udowski, and it's, uh, we thought it was excellent work, and we were fortunate enough to uh, be asked to write the editorial to this, uh, this paper in Annals. And what they pointed out is that the methodology that had been used up to this point um, was really designed to des design a model that matched your, your data as closely as possible, right? So this is the cohort of patients that you use to make your risk score, okay? <clears throat> so you're making your risk score, you say, okay, what factors in my cohort predict risk and uh, to what extent, and can we come up with a mathematical formula that will allow us to predict? And so the methodology used was matching really closely. The problem is when you try to apply this application or this algorithm to your target population, it doesn't match very well. It's, it's really good for the cohort that you derived it in, but doesn't work as well as the argument they're making. And so they introduced some methodology where you get a kind of a more general um, uh, equation for the data and that it would perform better. And we took this as an opportunity to talk about what we're working on, which is a Bayesian approach to risk prediction. Without getting into the details, that would solve the problem of matching your data um, so closely, or what we call overfitting your data to your, to your derivation uh, cohort, the cohort that you use to make your score, uh, and it'll be more, we think will be more generalizable. And it also has a great feature, which it gives you uh, a confidence interval. It's not a, a, what we traditionally think is a confidence interval, but it, it is uh, an interval of where you would ex have 95% confidence that's where your estimate is. And we think that that's really uh, useful to patients and clinicians. So if you calculate a risk score on your patient of 7%, 7% risk of a, 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 car a, a cardiac event over the next 10 years, but the confidence interval around that is somewhere between 1% and 20%, then you're thinking, okay, I need to do something else. Maybe I do need to do a coronary calcium score. Maybe I need to do a stress test. Something to further risk stratify the patient. As opposed to getting a 7% back, that your 95% confidence interval is somewhere between 6 and 8%, right? So we think that's a really a good feature. The next thing we want to do is we want to kind of change the paradigm of how we think about risk prediction. Uh, and a Bayesian model would let us do this as well. 
instead of giving a 10-year absolute risk, right? This is the current standard guideline recommended risk score. You get a 10-year risk score. So you sit down, it's a 7% risk over the next 10 years of having an event. Well, we all know and we, we, we realize that if you're calculating this on a 30-year-old, they have substantial underlying lifetime risk factors like high cholesterol and hypertension. Still, their 10-year their risk is very low. Very unlikely they're going to have an event between the age of 30 and 40. On the flip side, if you're seeing a 95-year-old patient in your clinic and you calculate their risk score, it's going to be tremendous. But it's very unlikely that putting them on aspirin and statin is going to make any meaningful difference. Right? So what we're working on is models that show us what the impact of therapy would be, the estimated impact of therapy. Okay, so this is a, a depiction of a patient coming to you at age 65, okay, and they're alive. And this is their predicted event-free survival. So this is how, um, how, how what you predict their, uh, a person like this, their event-free survival will be. So basically, what's their, their odds of getting to age 80 without having a cardiovascular event, a meaningful cardiovascular event? And if we use as a standard the 50th percentile, we could put numbers that could be discussed with our patients. So we think, you know, so this patient comes in and um, we calculate their, their new cardiovascular risk score. And it, it says, we, you know, your predicted event-free survival on the 50th percentile is to make it to age 78 with this confidence interval around it because it's a Bayesian calculation. So that's what you say, okay, you do nothing, you're, you're, 65 years now, if you do nothing, we think that you, you're, you, know, the, you have a 50-50 chance of making it age 78 without having an event. However, if we put, start you on a statin, here's what your event-free survival looks like. We could push that uh, event-free survival out to the 50th percentile from age 78 to age 90 with this conference interval. However, if we wait, if we wait, we start statin when you're 70 years old because you don't want to take a pill every day, well, then we're going to lose a little bit. Your event-free survival is going to be to age 81. You've lost some time here from missing out on therapy, right? I didn't put an example, but you can imagine if we were all the way out here at, you know, age 90, it's going to be really hard to move that curve. We think this might be a, an approach that would be very more useful to clinicians and patients to understand their risk and to make decisions, appropriate decisions about using uh, preventive therapy. Okay, so now we're on to the, the last three things. Um, and we uh, started off by trying to tackle this pr problem with an invited uh, viewpoint from Dr. Boley in, in circulation about what are we really talking about when we say we are predicting cardiovascular events? Okay, and we think that this is worth talking, talking about. So the first thing is that the diagnosis of NSTEMI, which is the majority of heart attacks, has changed tremendously, right? So in those pooled cohort equation cohorts, they were diagnosing heart attacks with CKMB. When troponin was first introduced in the 1990s, the sensitivity, the, if you look at the studies, then the sensitivity went up anywhere from 28% to 200%, right? And this is with first-generation troponins. When second-generation troponins came out, they were 50% more sensitive than, than, than the first generation. So now you're talking about uh, diagnostics that are 250% more sensitive. That's capturing a lot more myocardial infarction. And of course, we're up to fifth generation troponins now, but this number you know, doesn't get, so you know, we're, we're, we're diagnosing a lot more heart attacks. This has significant implications. So if you look at uh, you know, the, the AHA and morbidity mortality reports from the CDC, they all tell you that the incidence of acute MI is going down. But those estimates don't take into account that not only are they going down, they're going down despite the fact we're, di we're, we're diagnosing smaller and smaller and smaller heart attacks. If we had this, you know, this type of sensitive troponin assays in 1960, the incidence of MI you could, you could bet would be higher, maybe 300% higher or something. So this has real implications for how we look at MI uh, over time. 
And then, of course, there's been a recognition, right? So when troponin first came out in the, the, in the late 90s, and even in the early 2000s, the, the, you know, the clinical gestalt was that any positive troponin is an acute MI, right? We now know, and we'll talk about, that there's multiple distinct etiologies of myocardial injury. Right? We don't, every positive troponin is not even a myocardial infarction. It, it may be an, an acute non-ischemic myocardial injury or a chronic elevation. We'll talk a little bit about what that means. And then, of course, we know that there's different types of myocardial infarctions. So just to say, hey, we're going to predict myocardial infarction, or even in clinical trials where we say, you know, we've prevented myocardial infarction, we think it's very important to, to really get down and specify what exactly you're talking about. Okay, so how is uh, myocardial injury defined now? So this is uh, the fourth universal definition of MI. It's a long read, but I think it's a very comprehensive uh, and extremely important and useful document. So this really lays out the taxonomy, the definitions of these different disease states. Because um, as, as Willis Hurst uh, is famous for saying multiple times, unless you define a disease, you can't talk about it or learn about it. Because right? if one person causes an MI one thing, another person somewhere else calls it another, you really need to be on the same page. So this provides very clear definitions. And this is just a summary slide that I made of these definitions. Right? So it starts with myocardial injury. Okay? This is injury to the myocardium, and it's really defined by an elevated troponin. And what I mean by elevated is more than the 99th percentile of a healthy population. Okay? So these are, you know, and everyone's familiar with, po you know, what people call positive troponins. These are elevated troponins. So the first, um, uh, you know, step in, in, in defining uh, what this myocardial injury is, is to make a determination whether it's an acute injury or a chronic injury. So this is basically a dynamic rise and fall in troponin. Excuse me. A dynamic rise and fall or when it's a stable pattern. If it's stable, you're done. You've made your diagnosis. It's chronic myocardial injury and, and should be treated uh, as such. If it's an acute rise and fall, then you next need to determine whether this is from an ischemic cause or a non-ischemic cause. Ischemic is myocardium that is not receiving enough oxygen. Okay? And that could be from demand or supply, but it's a myocardial uh, and, and, and an ischemic myocardial injury has been dubbed and is a term that's not going away of myocardial infarction. So a myocardial infarction is a myocardial injury, an acute myocardial injury, that's caused by the myocardium not having enough oxygen. Okay? If, there's a, if, if, if you have an acute myocardial injury that's from a non-ischemic cause, it falls into this category here, acute non-ischemic myocardial injury. Of course, myocardial infarction, is, there could be several causes, but the two that are clinically most important are type 1, which is a lack of oxygen getting to the myocardium because of a plaque rupture atherothrombotic event blocking blood flow in a coronary artery, and type 2, which is inadequate oxygen for any other reason. Okay, so that's more of a kind of a catchment term. <clears throat> this is just a cartoon showing what, what that is and what we're dealing with. So, Myocardial infarction, so lack of adequate oxygen for that myocardium resulting in a myocardial injury. Type 1 is a plaque rupture with an occlusive thrombus. Um, and then type 2 could be a variety of things. It could be from vasospasm. It could be from a fixed fibrostenosis that has no atherothrombotic component. Or it could just be from you know, severe uh, supply-demand imbalance with tachyarrhythmias, hypoxemia, anemia. And then we have this whole category of non-ischemic myocardial injury. So this is acute myocardial injury that's not from a lack of oxygen getting to the myocardium. And these are things like myocarditis, chemotherapy, severe acidosis like we see in our septic or DKA patients. Okay? So we have these disease states. They lay out a nice taxonomy. Are they important? Do we see these things? So there's a bunch of studies out there. I'm just going to highlight one of about 4,000 patients that came to a hospital like ours who the physician felt or a physician felt that the, uh, measuring for myocardial injury was uh, indicated and a troponin was drawn. 
So out of those troponins, 42% of them are elevated, right? And I think that this is consistent with our clinical care, right? So people showing up and physicians are suspicious, 42% at an elevated uh, uh, troponin and therefore diagnosis of myocardial injury. However, only 30% of those are myocardial infarction. The other 70% are acute or chronic myocardial injury. So now, unlike in the 1990s and 2000s where every elevated troponin was an MI, you can see here that your chances, of, you know, if you have an elevated troponin, the overwhelming odds are that it's not a myocardial infarction, okay? And then this study didn't do it, but multiple studies have looked at this 30%. And it, it, it turns out that it's about 50-50, depending on, you know, what patient population you're talking about, a type 1 versus type 2 split, right? So 40% of all troponins drawn are elevated. 15% are a type 1 MI that we classically think about when we think about heart attack. 15% type 2. And 70% acute non-ischemic myocardial injury. Are those other diagnoses important? This is a summation slide from that circulation paper that, that Dr. Bully was so nice to, to, uh, to advertise for me that's published this month. Um, and we looked at all the, you know, the majority of high quality studies looking at the outcomes of these patients. So this is all cause mortality after a diagnosis of type 1, type 2, or myocardial injuries made. So type 1 classic MI that we think of as you know, these dots in red, and this is time out from the diagnosis in years. And you can see here that uh, the mortality goes up the longer you, you make it out. And it gets to be quite high. By year five, this study by Chapman, 40% mortality rate after having a type 1 MI. However, if you look at type 2 in myocardial injury, and this is you know, the, before the formal definition, but it's most consistent with acute non-ischemic myocardial injury, those mortality rates are even higher. So it's not enough to just say this is not a type 1 MI, forget about it. These patients are clearly at tremendous risk, even more risk than our type 1 MIs. So we see this as a big problem. My group sees a big problem, right? Despite the greater prevalence, the high mortality, and distinct pathological differences between these different uh, myocardial injury events, there's no prospective cohorts that have identified these different types of myocardial injury. I'm going to skip that. So this brings to, you know, things that we hold very dear and certain in medicine, right? These is just, the, you know, many of cartoons that are showing, here's your risk factors for heart attack, right? Diabetes, high blood pressure, et cetera. My question is, is high cholesterol a risk factor for type 1 MI? Type 2 MI, acute non-ischemic myocardial injury, or all three, right? And then you're talking about making risk scores. If cholesterol is a risk factor for type 1 but not type 2, and the cohorts we're using to, to judge and validate these scores are 70% type 2 MI, that's going to give us a real hard time making an accurate risk prediction. Let me just kind of show you one of these cases because we, we talk about using these risk scores all the time and we have a lot of confidence in cohorts like Mesa and we should, they're outstanding. But times have changed. So here is a case from Mesa. I work, you know, have the privilege of working with them. So I pulled the case. This is a case from Mesa that went for physician adjudication for whether it was an event or not. And it was a case in early 2000s. So not modern day viewing, okay? So this went to physician adjudication, and <clears throat> there's a lot more records, but I'll go through it quickly. It's a 50-year-old, long-time polysubstance abuser who struggled for, for many years but cannot kick addiction and has had multiple admissions for DTs, and he comes in and is admitted for DTs again, and while he's um, going through DTs, he has a rather long run of monomorphic VT. A code is called, but he wakes up before anyone does any chest compressions or so forth, so it, it, it was uh, spontaneously converted. Um, but, you know, nonetheless, uh, here's his EKG, as, uh, right after the code, not the greatest, probably some electrolyte abnormalities there. And of course, they drew a troponin, right? And here's uh, his troponin of 0 
with a three times the, uh, the, 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 the 99th percentile. This is a three-fold higher troponin. Is this an acute MI? Is this what we're trying to predict with our risk score? Um, you could prevent it by treating him with aspirin or statin, right? This was adjudicated as an MI in MESA, right? So this is what we're basing on. This is why we think it's so important. And to be quite honest, they didn't have a choice, right? The adjudication committee didn't have a ch They didn't say, the question is MI or not. It didn't say, is this a acute non-ischemic myocardial injury, a type 1 MI, type 2, is it a type? So we see that as a, a big problem. Our solution that we're proposing is adjudicating all the clinical events suspected of myocardial injury in MESA. And we'll call, you know, we'll figure out whether they're an MI or not, and if they are, what type, there's types one through five, one and two is what's most important clinically. And we'll have a category for acute non-ischemic myocardial injury, chronic uh, non-ischemic myocardial injury, you know, based on the taxonomy put forth in the fourth universal definition of MI, which is an agreement, right? This is a consensus document from the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, European Society of Cardiology, and the World Health Federation, right? You never get more than agreement than that. So we want to do this because this will result in the first cohort. You know, it's a very simple idea. We think it's a very simple idea, but we think that uh, simple doesn't, doesn't mean um, uh, 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 not novel or, or not useful. We think that simple is the way to go. So this is a very simple idea that no one's done before. No one's looked at this. So we would be able to really tell you something about what the relationship are between traditional risk factors in these type of events, what the incident of these events is. We don't know what the incidence. All we know is the proportion of people who show up. But we don't know how common this is in the general population. This would tell us that. Right? And then I think most important is it would give us an avenue to look at novel risk factors. Right? So if you have something that you think is specific for type 1 after thrombotic MI, you may not see that if you're just uh, trying to uh, see if it has an impact on overall MI because if it's not related to type 2 and that's what's being called an MI and this kind of uh, heterogeneous outcome of MI, you may miss it. So we think it could be very valuable. And of course, we think it'll be very valuable for risk prediction. If the pathology of these events is different, it behooves us to think that the risk factors will be different. Right? So the risk factors for type 1 will likely be different than the risk factors for type 2 and the risk factors for acute non-ischemic myocardial injury. That doesn't mean we're going to have a risk score where we come in and we tell patients your risk for type 1 is this, to we, we could still give an overall acute myocardial injury risk score, but the way you build that score is internally, you'll have to look at each thing individually and the right risk factors for each of them and then kind of add them up at the end. That's not what's currently doing, so we think our risk prediction will be much better. I'm going to skip through our hypothesis to get to how we're going to do this. So MESA, which I told you I worked with, it started in 2000. There's been 18,975 clinical events since it started. And uh, that's really amazing that they've been able to keep track of all of them. Fortunately for us who want to do this project is there's a very aggressive and robust evaluation process where a research nurse in real time is going after these events, compiling the data, and then deciding is it a, 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 you know, and an algorithm or, and, and committee deciding whether it needs to go to full physician adjudication as a potentially cardiac or vascular related event. When we do that, we wind up with 4,865 events that went for full adjudication in MESA. And man, do they have records. They have everything on these cases, which is great. So on average, 35 pages of medical records, well organized. Um, all of them have an H&P, a discharge summary, I mean, they really have information on these. Almost all of them have an EKG, uh, a troponin that was drawn, some of them more than one troponin. Um, and this is from kind of our preliminary data looking at this. And then, of course, the ones that are adjudicated as MI have a lot uh, of that data. But even the ones that are not adjudicated, still uh, all the tools there that we think we need to make a, a diagnosis. So what we're proposing is taking all these 4,800 cases <clears throat> and doing two physician adjudication. Two physicians will independently look at it. They'll score these cases. If they agree, that's the final diagnosis. 
If they don't agree, it'll go to a third uh, physician adjudicator. And if that third doesn't agree with the other two, it'll go to a expert panel that we've created for, for further discussion. And the head of the panel will make the, the final decision on the adjudicated event. These are the things we'll keep after. So we're going to get data on more than just the final diagnosis, which we've laid out here. Okay, So type 1, type 2. If it's a type 2, we've, we've parsed it out a little further, since that's kind of a catch-all term. And then the different types, and of course, acute non-ischemic myocardial injury and chronic injury. But we'll keep track of also the factors that are going along this and what data we have on these patients. We did our preliminary study. We pulled 40 cases from MESA. When we look at the cases in MESA that were adjudicated as an acute MI, so what MESA is calling an MI, and we re-adjudicate them, uh, what we see is we agree most of the time. Uh, excuse me, not agree. So what, the, what MESA is calling an acute MI currently, 60% of those we thought were type 1 MI, 25% type 2, percent were type 3 through 5, and then just a very small portion were this acute or chronic myocardial injury. So they're clearly kind of weeding out the acute and chronic myocardial injury, and then the MIs uh, are mostly what they're focusing on are type 1 MIs. When we looked at the cases that were not adjudicated as an MI, um, we found that 34 percent of them had evidence of myocardial injury. All right, that's a lot more cases, and we know, I've showed you data already, that myocardial injury is a very strong prognosticator for mortality. And of those cases, um, uh, th there was no type 1. They didn't miss, we don't think they missed any there. 10% were type 2, but the large majority, 25% uh, of those uh, uh, cases that were not adjudicated as a myocardial infarction were myocardial, had evidence of myocardial injury. So, you know, this is preliminary data, but we project it after, you know, when we, we project it on the whole population of, of MESA, of these 4,568 cases, what we think is going to come out from our preliminary data is that 10% will be type 1 MI, 30, per, excuse me, uh, getting away from me, 30% will be type 2 MIs, a few of these type 3 through 5, and 60% acute or chronic myocardial injury. So this is what we think the events will look like, and this will give us a really a wealth of information to say what risk factors predict each of these things. We've looked, we've taken a peek already, and these numbers are too small to make real comparisons, but traditional and, and uh, some novel risk factors are different based on these kind of diagnoses of different types. Okay. So in the last few minutes, I want to start talking about the difference between atherosclerotic plaque and, uh, and, and, and true atherothrombotic events. And I, I alluded to this earlier. So this is the idea that we think is overlooked all too much, is that risk prediction models, for the most part, are we really think are atherosclerosis prediction models. So these are the risk factors for having atherosclerosis or for having coronary disease. And while atherosclerosis and coronary disease is a, a, a required or, or a requisite for having a myocardial infarction, in of itself is not adequate, right? And we've all seen this clinically, patients with tons of coronary disease who have never had an event, right? And then, then there's others that come in with a STEMI and the, there's one spot of plaque rupture and atherothrombosis, and the rest of the coronary tree is completely clean, right? So we think that that is an issue, right? So this process is necessary, but not adequate for this, okay? And here's how we think about it. So this is a cartoon that we have drawn in our lab, showing a, you know, a cartoon of a normal coronary artery, Here's a, a coronary artery with stable plaque, which most people in industrialized nations will have at some point. But this doesn't cause an event, right? It could cause, if it got severe enough, it can cause angina and so forth. And we've learned from the COURAGE trial, now the ischemia trial, that putting a stent and opening it up doesn't, doesn't change any clinical outcomes, right? But so this is not what causes an event, but it's required for event. But the steps that need to occur is first there needs to be some sort of disruption to this plaque. And most people think of this as plaque rupture, but you know, it can just be a little plaque disruption. 
And we know from pathology studies that even that's not enough. Plaques can rupture and they can heal, right? It doesn't, it doesn't, it makes sense that you should have just normal, what we call normal homeostatic coagulation to seal up that necrotic core. And that this is what happens the majority of time and no one knows about it. You go about your day, there's no pain. There's nothing going on because that, that would all be downstream events. So that this plaque is disrupted and then you have a healing thrombus over it, okay? As opposed to maybe 20% of the time, some estimates are much less, there's a disruption and you get this completely out of control pathological thrombosis that um, totally occludes the artery and leads to a myocardial infarction, right? This doesn't make sense. This isn't the right thing that would happen. You would think that this is, should be what happens, right? Self-preservation. So we want to study this. We, we're, we're interested in what are the drivers of this process? What it, and, and by the way, these pathology studies show healed plaques in patients that ultimately die of this. So these are people that have had multiple, uh, and you know, in some case series, 30 plaque ruptures that have healed over, and then finally one that led to a pathological thrombosis and killed them. So we have this two-hit hypothesis. Sure, you need the plaque, you need the plaque disruption, which is the first hit, but you need some other driver to make you have an event, or you should, otherwise you would just heal over. How do we study this? So we study this by creating very um, uh, well phenotyped and specific uh, patient cohorts. So our cohort, we have uh, been able to, in a uh, retrospective way, definitively de define acute thrombotic myocardial injury. So this process that's going on. And we made a comparison group of acute non-thrombotic myocardial injury. So someone who has this, but not this. And then we have another control group of stable coronary artery disease. So here's the idea, how are we gonna find out more about this second hit or this driver of thrombosis? So we take these patients who have, we've definitively defined, and we do that by um, sucking the thrombus out of their coronary and sending it to a pathologist who says, that's what we're dealing with. My, my fingers are too fat for this controller. I keep hitting backwards. So we have a sample at the time of their heart attack where we uh, have histologically diagnosed them as a type one thrombotic MI. And we have a quiescent phase follow-up in the same patient. We go after them three months later. We take another sample. We do the same for our acute non-ischemic myocardial injury. These are patients going to the cath lab, elevated troponins, but no evidence of atherothrombosis going on, but clear evidence that they had a myocardial injury. So high troponins, completely clean coronaries. And then finally, we have patients who have the underlying atherosclerosis, but are not having atherothrombosis. These are patients with stable CAD going for an elective cath and stent. And we compare them. So we're looking for what is different at this time in this patient compared to when they're not having a heart attack, and is also uniquely different compared to acute non-ischemic or non-thrombotic MI going to the cath lab or a stable CAD going to the cath lab. So our first cohort was 80 subjects. We had some in each of these groups. And we, one of the things we, they, we did was we looked at things that made sense. You go to the literature, what are the things that would be likely from what we understand about biology that may be driving pathological thrombosis as well as, as opposed to homeostatic hemostasis. So this was work by Sam Tamikis' group, who we've now worked with quite extensively. And what they were able to show is that oxidation of plasminogen was a major driver of its activity. So if there was a lot of oxidized phospholipids on plasminogen, it worked really well, digested a lot of clot. And if there wasn't, it didn't work so well. And that's what this slide shows here. So we said to Sam, hey, can we measure this in our cohort? And we did, and we were able to show that the OXPL on, on, on plasminogen was much lower in our acute MI patients, but what's special about our cohort is that we have thrombotic MI and non-thrombotic. And again, we showed that in our thrombotic MI group, 
The OXPL levels were low, meaning their plasminogen did not work very well. So we thought it was great. That this may be a driver. Well, it's, it wasn't an acute driver because we saw here at follow-up, it was also low. So this may be a constitutive risk factor, right? If you're someone who's unlucky enough to not have an, uh, enough uh, OXPL in your plasminogen, you're at heightened risk all the time that if you rupture a plaque, you may get a pathological thrombus as opposed to a healing one. So how to look at this further? Well, we have MESA. We don't have it, but we work very closely with MESA. And so we put an ancillary study in and we measured OXPL in all 6,800 people in the year 2000 and we're tracking to see, well, who's going to have a heart attack? And instead of just looking at OXPL, we looked at a number of things that report your propensity to make a thrombus, like D-dimer and factor, you know, um, factor 8 and plasminogen, antiplasmin complex, fibrinogen levels. We made a comprehensive thrombotic score. When we look at that, you see clear differences between who's going to have a, quote, Acute MI, which I trashed in the beginning of the talk by saying it's a whole smattering of things. Hopefully we'll get funded so that we could, we could do this for just type 1 MIs in MESA compared to type 2. But you see here your event-free survival is much, much better if you have low levels of OXPL and thrombotic markers. If you're high, your event-free survival at, for, for a cardiovascular event is lower. And these are ASCVD events. So we're, we're working on that. Um, in the last couple of minutes, I want to show that we, we're also very interested in having clinically actionable diagnostics for these different types of myocardial injury. Okay, so um, Dr. Boley mentioned this, this paper in circulation, which I'll, I'll shamelessly uh, plug now because I think it is helpful um, when we're seeing these patients. And what we've tried to do here is give clinicians a guide to how to use the taxonomy put forth in the fourth universal definition MI. So what I didn't tell you about that great document is they lay out the, the definitions and they show how there's clear pathological differences. What they don't tell you is how to apply it, how to make the diagnosis. Right? And in reality, we all know there is no gold standard for calling something a type 2 MI or an acute um, non-ischemic myocardial injury. It's really clinical gestalt at this point. So we do, we, we do the best we can with laying out what we think is the way to go about that. We give some kind of guidance of how we think you should approach these patients, not only for making the diagnosis, but actively managing these patients, right? You can't sit around on an elevated troponin, you know, myocardial injury, waiting around to make a definitive diagnosis without doing something for the patient uh, because there's, you know, they, this, you know, obviously uh, these diagnoses have severe consequences and things like type 1 atherothrombotic MI need very timely treatment. Okay, so we lay that out and then we also hopefully try to, 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 to make the recognition that there's a lot of uncertainty in making these diagnoses and your level of certainty of how likely it is a type 1 or how likely you are to harm the patient with your therapy is what goes into the decision making. On the research front, we are pushing very hard to make a di you know, to, to develop new diagnostic tools that are clinically actionable, meaning when the patient comes to the hospital, things that we can have up front to help us sort out and treat these patients. So we think that and have for a long time that it's incredible, and we don't think about it enough clinically that. Probably the, the, one of the most common um, differential diagnosis of myocardial infarction and one of the most deadly diagnoses worldwide is made on circumstantial evidence, right? So there's few examples of this in medicine, but what I'm getting at is all of our diagnostics, chest pain, shortness of breath, EKG changes, troponin, are all a reflection of dead heart muscle. But the therapeutic target that we're thinking about when someone hits the door with those symptoms is the clot, right? Aspirin, P2Y12 inhibitor, heparin, rush to the cath lab, right? Even for STEMI, on carefully done studies, 20% of STEMIs that go 
true SD elevation on their EKG, don't have an athrothrombotic event. 80%, which is high, and you should rush those patients to the cath lab to find out. But my point is, there's few examples in medicine where we're not diagnosing the therapeutic problem, right? You, we're, 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 we're diagnosing the downstream event and giving treatment for something that we think is causing that downstream event, right? So we, we are working very hard to have things that directly make a, a diagnosis of that athrothrombotic process. We think that'll change the paradigm of how we approach these patients. Currently, right, patients come in, about six million patients per year to US emergency room with signs and symptoms that are concerning to the ER doc for MI. We draw a troponin, sometimes it's very elevated, so it's clearly ischemia, and what do we do? We assume it's a type 1 MI, appropriately so in this day and age, because we don't have the tools to tell us it's not. We assume it is, and if it is, that's great. They got their, the right treatment. If it's not, meaning we already showed you data, 70% of those elevated troponins won't even be any kind of MI, and you know, 85% of them won't be a, an acute athrothrombotic MI. Well, they're getting unnecessary risk of bleeding from their aspirin, their heparin drip, Maybe they're, they're, they're P2Y12 inhibitor, maybe inappropriately taken to the cath lab. And then those that have kind of these borderline myocardial injury, they get admitted, they get a stress test the next day, they get seen by an ER doc, maybe a cardiology consult, maybe a hospitalist. You know, they're, they're touched by 15 different nurses over three shifts, and it costs the health system on average $10 billion a year to tell them that they have nothing. This is not treatment cost. This is not for the people who have something. This is what it costs us to send people home from the hospital with nothing. So in our new paradigm, we, we said, that, sure, we should look for ischemia, but if we're trying to develop a new biomarker of atherothrombosis, maybe a propensity score, like we used to do with VQ scans. Now someone comes in, they get an they get a ischemia marker, and they get an atherothrombosis marker. If the atherothrombosis marker is positive, you got good evidence that you're dealing with a thrombotic MI, even if the, the troponin is not elevated, right? Because maybe it just hasn't been long enough for enough heart muscle to die for it to become positive. And really, the rule out here would be great, right? So that if they, their troponin was negative and their atherothrombosis marker was negative, maybe be able to, to triage these patients more appropriately. If they have evidence of myocardial injury, but no evidence of thrombosis, well then, you know, that this sends us down a different diagnostic and treatment pathway for acute non-ischemic myocardial injury, type 2 MI, et cetera. We're doing that by studying our group, and I'm quickly running out of time, but I will tell you that we've done molecular fingerprinting of our, our, our patients at the time of their acute thrombotic MI, and we look for differences, um, and this is you know, just one example of different metabolites that are different in our acute atherothrombotic MI patients compared to our two control groups. We've looked at this a number of ways and come up with uh, you know, different ways for trying to uh, make this uh, diagnosis, and uh, that's what we're aggressively pursuing. And uh, just want to show this last summary slide. So in summary, what we're working towards is new methodology for risk prediction. We're doing this in two ways. We're changing the statistics. So we want to predict the impact of therapy on lifetime event-free survival. And we need to provide estimates of uncertainty around these estimates when we give people uh, their risk estimate. We think it's very important, hopefully we've been able to convince you that it, there are different subtypes of myocardial injury. They have distinct pathology and likely have distinct risk profiles and certainly will have distinct therapeutic profiles. And so therefore, we need to accurately diagnose these different subtypes. And then finally, working to identify the drivers of atherothrombosis. This will have diagnostic and therapeutic implications. This is my lab, who I talked about in the beginning. Uh, many of them are here, and, and all of them who've uh, contributed significantly to this work. Thanks for your time this morning.
very interesting um, uh, discussion. I have a question about troponin. So I think troponin is becoming a major source of uh, expenditure in the medical system. Uh, we see consoles where we are called for uh, what we call troponitis, right, which is an increase in troponin, and I always say we need to have antibodies to lower troponin, and that will solve the patient problem, <laughs> right? Now, seriously, you see these uh, slight elevations in troponin. Could be a very small injury, but, I mean, are we going after uh, smaller and smaller um, uh, problems and spending a lot of time and resources on... Uh, M very minor, a few myocytes that are being injured, do you think? Or, uh, I mean, I'm not sure this high sensitivity troponin is helping us a lot. What do you think? Yeah, so there's a, a, a famous quote from um, a, a clinical pathologist that said, when troponin was a bad test, it was great. And now that it's a good test, right. it's terrible. So uh, there's, a, there's a couple nuances that make it really hard. So these slight elevations in troponin, uh, they, they are associated with, with terrible outcomes, even when you're below the 99th percentile. So if you look at um, gradations like quintiles above the limit of detection but below the 99th percentile, both for hospital patients as well as out in the community, even when you're the, the, the patients that are um, below the 99th percentile but higher than well, lower the limit of detection or the first quintile within that range, they do worse. They have more cardiovascular events and they have higher rates of mortality. So while it's tempting to say, look, this little elevation is not a type 1 athrothrombotic event, um, you know, don't consult me, this is silly, uh, it is identifying a patient that's clearly at increased risk. Now, how to treat that patient is an unknown at this right, point. Right. Um, and we don't know that doing all these things that we, that we do make any difference at all. And so I, I think that that's what makes it a real struggle. Yes. Yeah, so hard question. We try to tackle that issue in the white pages. I mean, that's exactly what we're trying to tackle is how to approach these patients. Um, and, and, you know, the, I don't necessarily think that, that every um, myocardial injury uh, is best served by a cardiologist, right? So, you know, we put up there all these, these causes. So, um, acute non-ischemic myocardial injury from chemotherapy and someone who's in the throes of their chemo uh, might do better with their oncologist. Uh, but of course the oncologist needs to recognize that this is an elevated risk patient. But the risk is total mortality. Uh, it's not necessarily, the, the, it's not risk that they're going to have a plaque rupture. Um, when someone is in DKA with a pH of 6.9, they're going to have a very high troponin from a lot of myocardial injury. Uh, but the way to treat that injury is to treat their DKA, right? So um, sorting that out, I think, is, is the issue. I, I do think it's, it's uh, very difficult. And that's what drove me to write the paper. Um, and um, hopefully that, that provides some guidance. But I completely agree with you that there's more work that needs to be done, um, that we could have clinically actionable diagnostics for these different subtypes. Currently, we have clinical expert opinion for these subtypes. 
And Andy, I was struck by one other thing in your presentation. So the long-term outlook for patients with uh, non-thrombotic events, with elevated troponins without um, non-type 1 MIs, the long-term mortality is even higher than type 1 MIs. So type 2 MIs, you're talking about patients with anemia, patients with um, thyrotoxicosis, uh, maybe drug addiction. I suppose the mortality in those patients is not cardiac mortality, it's extra cardiac, right? Yeah, so um, two answers to that question. So one is first you got to try to make the distinction between type 2 MI and acute non-ischemic myocardial injury. Uh, and those, you know, the distinction is is this an ischemic event or not? So those having an ischemic event, um, uh, it seems they have higher mortality that is cardiovascular and non-cardiovascular related, both. Uh, and then, and one of the major drivers of that is that it, when you look at who's having these type two MI, it's patients that are uh, with an assortment of comorbidities, right? Your patient who's got renal disease, COPD, liver disease, advanced age, all these risk factors that are risk factors for other causes of death. So you have competing risk for other causes of death. That being said, even when the statisticians try to can take that into account and statistically model, well, if I account for the COPD, the renal failure, the liver, it, they still are elevated. No one's able to, you know, only one study did it correct all the way back that the relative risk was the same as type 1 MI. Hmm. So I think there's much to be done. There, some of it, the risk is explained by who the patients are, as you point out, the comorbidities that they carry, uh, and some of that risk is cardiovascular, but it looks like it, there's an equal amount that is non-cardiovascular as well from this competing risk. Henry? Yeah, yeah, certainly. So that is almost the quintessential chronic myocardial injury patient population uh, for, for a number of reasons. Um, and they, within that population, the gradation of troponin is related to gradation of mortality. So the higher the, the, the level of myocardial injury, even though it's chronic, the higher the mortality risk compared to that same uh, patient group. And as you, 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 you know and we've talked about, you know, this is one of the only patient populations that statin therapy has failed, right? The Aurora trial, uh, GC, uh, both failed, uh, but, you know, with, with resuvastatin to reduce uh, event rates in this chronic um, dialysis patient population. So what to do for that patient population, I think, is, is unknown. No one has been able to show uh, true, true benefit of any uh, specific therapeutic action for the chronic myocardial injury. But yes, a very, very high risk group. Yes. Yeah, well studied, and it absolutely does. So depending on the assay and the cutoff, 100% of people who complete a marathon will have an elevated troponin that'll go back down. Um, yes, yeah, so very controversial area uh, with some studies saying that they are actually. Um, there was a, 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 you know, several studies, uh, you know, in the last, five years or so that show a J-point relationship with exercise. That if so, you do none, you do poorly. If you do some, you're doing great. If you do a lot, your mortality starts going up. Now, this is disquieting. So should we jog or not jog? <laughs> <laughs> you should jog at a, a, uh, um, a moderate pace. 
Yeah, so then people, you know, the controversy about um, uh, uh, what, what dose is right, and I'm not an expert on this area. There was a very good review in Jack, and I think it said, you know, that you should get, you know, about 30 minutes of exercise of moderate intensity a day. But if you start doing more than that, you start, you start going up, and your mortality rate starts going up rather than down. Henry, you want to comment? Five times, Five times 30. All right. Thank you very much, and thank you. Thank you.